Chapter One. This is the story behind one of the greatest manhunts in history. Maybe you read about it, or rather what they let you read about it, probably is some minor item buried somewhere in a back page. However, what happened in that city between May 16th and May 28th of this year was so incredible that to this day the facts have been suppressed in a massive effort to save certain political careers from disaster and law enforcement officials from embarrassment. This will be the last time I will ever discuss these events with anyone. So when you have finished this bizarre account, judge for yourself its believability, and then try to tell yourself, wherever you may be, it couldn't happen here. Sunday, May 16th. At approximately 2.30 a.m., Cheryl Hughes was standing at the intersection of Casino Center and Fremont Streets waiting for a girlfriend to give her a lift home. Cheryl Hughes was 23, 5 feet 5 and 1 half inches tall, 118 pounds, blonde hair, light brown eyes, swing shift change girl at the Gold Dust Saloon. Cheryl Hughes, tired and hungry, but just mad enough to walk the eight blocks to her small frame house off the corner of 9th and Bridger. Cheryl Hughes, en route to her doom. No evidence of dependent lividity, either. Peel back the chest flap, please. This should do it. It's incredible. Begin the gross work on internal organs. I'm going to phone the district attorney. And don't talk about this to anyone. I came into it two days later, called back 97 miles from the first vacation I had had in two and a half years because the story is so big no one else can handle it, according to our lovable managing editor. Rumor has it that the day Anthony Albert Vincenzo was born, his father left town. The story may be apocryphal, but I believe it. The only point I wonder about is why his mother didn't leave too. Good morning, slaves. We are not amused. Kolchak, you are on it. A two-day-old, third-rate murderer. You, you are on it. From vacant. What about them? They have other assignments. You're beautiful when you're angry. Out. Out. First stop, county general to see one of my most reliable spies. At least he used to be reliable. Hello, Carl. Oh, I thought you were disbarred from Mount Francis. I thought we were rid of you for two weeks. Yeah, so did I. Well, about this uh, Cheryl Hughes thing. Why does it say officially undetermined under cause of death? Why don't you ask the coroner? Oh, thanks. Come on, you're my spy here. But haven't I kept quiet about all those illegal operations you've been performing in closets? Come on, tell me true now, John. Was there anything unusual about the autopsy? No, I know she lost a lot of blood. Yeah, some spy. I'm just a poor, hard-working doctor that occasionally takes pity on an aging reporter. Dr. Yeah, O'Brien, any less like a Pulitzer Prize story to me. 
second stop. The Gold Dust Saloon and a chat with Gail Foster, one of Cheryl Hughes' fellow workers and a rather close friend of mine. Poor Cheryl. I feel just terrible about it, Carl. Well, honey, if you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to. No. No, I want to help if I can. You said that she never had any boyfriends. No, none that I ever heard of. She dated once in a while, but never the same man twice. I don't think she liked men. Yeah? Yeah. She even took karate lessons in case one got fresh with her. You mean that she knew karate? Yeah. Brown belt. Oh, I see him. I've got to go. Bye-bye. In any town the size of Las Vegas, the murder of one young woman hardly causes a ripple. But then the ripple started. Thursday, May 20th, 7.02 a.m. Over there. I didn't go down. I couldn't. Okay, okay. Don, take your statement. What took you so long, Kolchak? I got a flat tire. Not a footprint in sight. Is that physically possible? If it happened, it's possible. Well, it sure looked like it happened. Well, come on. Bonnie Reynolds, 27, divorced. Cocktail waitress at the Harem Room Casino. Look at her throat. She must have lost an awful lot of blood. Cheryl Hughes lost a lot of blood, too. Did you read that in the newspapers, did you? No, I didn't read that in the newspapers. This girl lost a lot of blood, Sheriff. But she didn't lose it here. Anything? We found a purse. There's signs of a struggle up here. But nothing in between. Only our footprints. What'd he do, throw her? Who said Bonnie Reynolds was thrown 22 feet into that car? The coroner? I haven't heard about it. Who said this new killing is connected with the Cheryl Hughes murder? The police? Not to me, they have it. Who said Cheryl Hughes died of massive blood loss? The coroner again? No, he hasn't even turned in his report yet. And who, may I ask, said that a super powerful madman is running loose in Las Vegas? You hearing voices, Cole Jack? I did not make up the facts. Oh, I know story. you're born. Big time reporter like you condemned to the sticks for those journalistic rules. I did not make up. I know up. you'd like a big fat byline on a big fat story so you can pay your way back to a big fat city job. I but did Cole not. Chuck, I expect you to report. Not to come up with fairy tales. And Kolchak, quit barking the PD. If something turns up, they'll let us know. Meanwhile, use your head and lay off. Whatever they're up to, they don't want any help from amateur bloodhounds like you. Friday, May 21st, 8.06 a.m. Apartment of Carol Hanacek. Swing shift cocktail waitress in the Bird of Paradise show lounge. She'd gotten home around 2.15 a.m., poured herself a glass of milk, opened the back door of the kitchen for reasons unknown, and died like the others. Suddenly, quietly, without disturbing her sleeping roommate only a few feet away. Something of a pattern had started to form, and it was ugly. It was then that people stopped talking. Does that surprise you? Look, Carl, you're not the only one that likes to play detective. The police, the sheriff boys, they all think they're pretty good. And they don't need you. You know, you really make me feel wanted. We've had three murders in town, Bernie. We have one tremendously strong guy, maybe more, who goes around killing young girls. And they all lost a lot of blood. Hey, you weren't supposed to know about that. You're not supposed to know about that. That I know. What about your people down at the Bureau? No, this is nothing for the Bureau to mess with at this stage. Yeah, well, you could make some unofficial inquiries for me. Like? 
Well, like, you could check around the country and check all the hospitals and see if any of them have had uh, corpses recently, like ours, you know, all with a big loss of blood. You could check all the uh, insane asylums across the country, the bug houses, see if they released recently a nut who thinks he's Count Dracula, even if he's done nothing to prove it. Do you believe in vampires, little boy? Oh, that's funny. That's very funny. It's very funny, pretty. Ha <laughs> ha. What are you going to do? Are you going to sit like a cheap gun of guzzling my beer? I'll think about it, okay? Meanwhile, I hope it doesn't disillusion you to know that the local law enforcement people go along with your views. Oh? Huh? Somewhat. At this moment, they're waiting for a special report from the coroner and two pathology experts who were flown up from LAP. Oh, yeah? Along with a small truck out of the clip. Yeah. Oh, hi, Marilyn. How are you? Hey, I like your luncheon place. Yeah. Well, say, if you want to hear the special report, meet me at the sheriff's office. It starts at 6.30. Hey, Tang! Don't thank me, just be there. Yeah. Where'd you go? Oh. Mr. Kolchak, telephone, please. Mr. Kolchak. Carl Kolchak. Jack. Hi, Carl. I just thought you'd like to know I heard the Parkway Hospital was knocked over. Yeah, knocked over for what? Cash, drugs, equipment, what? Blood. That's right. Every container in the place. Their entire stock. What about blood type? Seems blood type and RH factor didn't much matter. John. Can't stop now. See you. Yeah, but... p.m. Clark County Courthouse. Present, in addition to myself and two incompetents who called themselves reporters, were Warren Butcher of the Sheriff's Office, Thomas Payne of the District Attorney's Office, Captain Edward Masterson of the Las Vegas Police Department, and old buddy Bernie Jenks, holding forth with his inimitable cool, Dr. Robert McCurgy, boy coroner. We found that death in each case was extremely swift, coming in something less than a minute. After the initial wounds were inflicted, the blood was drained very quickly, some kind of suction device being used. Now, this would explain why no blood was found anywhere in the victims or in the areas they were discovered. Uh, Dr. Kolshak, Daily News, do you have any idea what could have made these wounds? They're not unlike the bite of a medium-sized dog. What do you mean, dog? Oh, what? Dog, dog, what are you telling us? A dog did these murders? I didn't mean to indicate that the wounds were actually inflicted by a dog, only that they're similar to those which might be caused by a dog. A rather interesting point is that we found another substance mixed in with the traces of blood in the throat wounds, namely saliva. What do you mean, saliva? I mean saliva, Sheriff Butcher. Human saliva. If McCurgy had suggested that the murders were committed by a giant butterfly, he couldn't have made more sparks. Now, what do you mean human? Are you suggesting that each of these women was bitten in the throat by a man? At present, the evidence points that way. However, I couldn't and wouldn't hazard a guess as to motivation. I can only be sure they each died from shock induced by massive loss of blood. Uh, Dr. McCurgy, is it possible that he killed these women by biting them in the throat for the express purpose of drinking their blood? Kolchak, now you're here by the mutual suffrage of us all. Uh, sufferance. <laughs> what? It's sufferance, sure. Well, whatever it is, just shut up. I'll answer that. There have been cases of people who, through some mental derangement, have come to believe they were vampires. In Germany in the 1920s, there was one fellow who did use his teeth to rip out his victims. Now, throats. we are not going to jump to any conclusions about who or what killed these women. It is possible, you know, to type a person's blood from his saliva. If I were you, gentlemen, I'd look for a very anemic fellow, possibly with some rare blood disease. Well, I don't care what kind of a nut killed these women. But I'll tell you this, he's out there, and I bet he's high on pot or the hard stuff, 
And he's going to kill again unless he's stopped. Masterson, what have your people got on this uh, Parkway blood theft? Well, the latest is the nurse said she saw something funny out there last night, or early this morning. Seems that a tall, skinny guy dressed as an orderly was nosing around the refrigerated storage area. That's where they keep the blood and the plasma. She didn't think much of it then, but later when she spoke about the guy to the to the floor super, she was told that there was no such tall, skinny guy on duty there. Description as follows. White male adult. Six feet two to six feet four, thin. About 175 pounds with pale complexion. Dark hair. So we start looking for a man, local resident, or worse yet, some outsider who may not even still be in the area. We check the airport, the bus terminal, railroad station, blockade the highways, and if we're lucky, we'll get him. If he's stupid enough to still be hanging around after three crimes. Now, you got any other suggestions? You just do it. All right, let's break this up. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Ma. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Payne, I shouldn't be too inclined to reject Mr. Kolchak's theory out of hand if I were you. It is at best highly speculative, but not altogether unwarranted. Kolchak. You can throw away that cassette. Now, this uh, vampire stuff is to stay right in this room. Until we have the assailant in custody, we say nothing about these uh, women being drained of blood. There'll be no rumors, no reports in the paper. The official opinion at this time is that the cause of death is undetermined. So we don't want to cause a panic. <laughs> it's bad for police operations. It's bad for the people. And it's bad for business. <laughs> Thank you for your cooperation. Well, uh, Kolchak, uh, I want to have a talk with you. Now, boys, there's no reason to bother the doctor anymore. I have a prepared statement in my office. You can go back to the lab. Well, Kolchak, you're becoming a real pest. I'll have to have a word or two with Vincenzo about you. You know, maybe one of the other boys at the office should handle this from here on. Keep your nose clean, son. Stay out of other people's business. <laughs> it's healthier that way. Carl, will you watch what you're saying? You know these guys. You could find yourself out of a job in 86 all over town. Did I go for you too, Jenks? Oh, boy, who can talk to you when you get like this? Now, listen, I'll nose around unofficially for you on anything you bring me, just between the two of us. But do me a favor and stay away from me for a few days, just for friendship's sake. Did I say it was a vampire? Well, what does your suggested headline say? The story makes it clear. Vampire killer in Las Vegas, question mark. Do I misread? The story makes it clear. Do I misread or did you use the word vampire? Some screwball who imagines he's a vampire is loose in Las Vegas and people ought to be told. If there's a screwball running around loose in Las Vegas, his last name begins with a K. You already heard about the little scene you have with the boys downtown. No vampire stories. Clear? How about a special featurette with a border of roses? Uh, an interview with the two girl victims in heaven uh, with a celestial choir in the background. Ow! Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I guess I fell asleep. Yeah. Uh, what were you saying? You know, you do great things for my masculine ego, you know? Yeah. Well, actually, I was saying that I, I think that Vincenzo has a new sense of a tree stump. It's got to be one man. It's got to be big, strong, psychotic. Well, you're certainly making me very glad that I work nights. Mm. Oh, well, I told you to quit working nights, didn't I? I am 
forever in your debt, love. What was that? The killer's done it again. Oh, no. Only this time, he was seen. Showgirl, 25, 5 feet 8 inches tall, 125 luscious pounds, less the weight of 12 pints of blood, of course. Well, yeah, looks like Bella Lugosi's struck again. Knock it off. It's her daughter. Oops. I'm all right now. Now, the car he drove away in, was it new? No. It was. A few years old, I think. It was Maroon Coop. I'll call it in. Uh, Barney, may I? Uh... Yeah, but uh, take it easy. Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Cole Shack, The Daily News. That was your daughter? My best contact in Las Vegas has always been Helen O'Brien, chief switchboard operator at the county courthouse. Hello, adorable. You're a sadist. Mm -hmm. Oh, I could take a bath. Ah, over my dead, plump body. Listen, you magnificent morsel. The DMV is checking on the suspect's car. Now, you couldn't help me in that area, could you? Of course not. Bribed again. Paul check. Yo, Bertie. Come on. How'd you like to see the killer's face? Sherman Duffy of the Chicago Globe once described a reporter as follows. Socially, he fits in somewhere between a hooker and a bartender. Spiritually, he stands beside Galileo because he knows the world is round. Not that it does much good, of course, when his editor knows it's flat. Oh, Jack. Shelley Forbes has got to be his fifth victim. Look at the way her dog was killed. You'll never give up, do you? What do you mean? I mean, this is unacceptable. Unacceptable! Oh, Jack, I'm very close to firing you. Even though the owner of this paper has a soft spot in his head for has-been big city reporters. I am tired of your pressure, Goljack. I'm tired of the owner's pressure. I'm tired of the pressure from all around me to blow this story up on the one hand and keep it under wraps on the other. I am tired of being the middleman, Goljack. Do you understand that? Can you understand that? 
What do you want, Vincenzo? A testimonial from Count Dracula? Out! Get out! What is this out, out, girl? Get out game we play! This nut thinks he is a vampire. He has killed four, maybe five women. He has drained every drop of blood from every one of them. Now, that is news, Vincenzo. News. And we are a news paper. We are supposed to print news, not suppress it. You know darn well why we're soft peddling this thing. No, tell me why. Could it be because we have been told to? Call Shaq, you are an idiot. Worse, you're irresponsible. All these murders mean to you is a bylaw. Well, what the hell difference does it matter what it means to me? The point is that we are suppressing news. We are withholding information. Everybody in town knows what's going on. The police, the DA, the coroner's office. The, the, every reporter on every newspaper in Las Vegas knows what's going on. The only people who don't know are the people. At last you got the point, Goldshack. The people in Las Vegas don't know. Because the people in Las Vegas would come unglued if they did know. Even more than they're coming unglued already. Capish? Tuesday, May 25th, 7.30 p.m. Helen O'Brien had told me that the DMV had come up with 16 possibles. All but one had been eliminated. The car owner's name, Martin Lubin. Address on Spring Mountain Road. Name and address, both phony. Name of salesman who sold car, Fred Hurley. So I set him a price. He don't say nothing, he just stands there looking at me. All right, now how'd you find out about this, Kolchak? Well, a fine little bird told me about it. Don't now you stop just my account. keep your mouth shut. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, uh, like I said, he just stands there looking at me. Then he tells me the price is too high. $300 too high. And he keeps staring at me as if daring me to tell him the price is $1,200. Is this fellow? Now, stop doing our job for us, Kolchak. That's already been established. Yes, yeah, well, you see, uh, I told him only he had a mustache. Mustache? Yeah. Yeah. Did you just sell him the car? Well, I started to say no. But something inside tells me, ah, don't mess with this guy. I mean, he's a creep. With them red eyes and that voice. He's enough to keep a guy from working nights. All my life, I've waited for a story like this. All my life. And when it finally comes, I can't get it printed. Do you know, the holes in Mary Brandon's neck were airbrushed out before they printed the photographs? Yeah. Carl, if you keep going on like this, you're going to get fired again. Mm -hmm. Let's see, how many times has it been? Uh, twice in Washington, mm -hmm. three times in New York, twice in Chicago. And once, or was it twice in Boston? Huh. I'm becoming extinct in my own lifetime. Homo nuzhakis, natural habitat, a pool of sour mash bourbon. You know, I really ought to light a candle to Ben Hecht. Here. You ought to quit your job, you know. And you'll support me? Well, I... Oh, come on, honey, I'm serious. That weirdo said five girls, and they were all night workers. Five? Yeah, five. Oh. Yeah. A girl named Shelley Forbes is missing, and I'll bet my bottom dollar she's victim number five. Hey, yeah, you know, you are insured pretty good there. Carl, I've been doing some thinking. Oh, what do you know about vampires? Well, only do they wear dinner suits and talk with marbles in their mouth. Oh, will you please be serious? my natural habitat, then. Open it. Oh. Everything you always want to know about vampires, we're afraid to ask. No, you're going to look at oh, come it. Come on, why? Well, what if the killers are real vampires? Oh, honey, please. I've well, had a very long week. He's done everything that's in this book. Oh, whoopee, whoopee. You're going to read it. Yes, all right. I'm going to read it. Ooh. Ah. Oh, now, come on. You're a big, tough reporter. You can take it. You might even get a good feature article out of it. Since the beginning of man's existence, there have been creatures of the night, crazed monsters that track the bloody prince through the pages of fact and fiction. Of them all, the vampire seems to have accumulated the largest body of documentation. By night, the vampire is virtually indestructible, fearing only the sign of the cross. Before daybreak, he must return to his coffin, otherwise he will be destroyed by the purifying rays of the sun. It is then, while he lies dormant, he can be destroyed 
by hammering a wooden stake through his heart. According to the legend, the victim of the vampire will ultimately rise again as the living dead and must be destroyed in a similar manner. From any source available, the vampire must have blood. duty as night editor when the PD squawk box went crazy about a wild brawl at the old town hospital. May 27th, 820 a.m. and things were rolling. Our morning edition hit the streets recapping all the action at the hospital. The TV people, as usual, had missed out completely and the radio stations were literally reading our copy on the air. But now the whole lid was really blown off. The maniac had been identified. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. I just got these out of the suit. Yeah. Now, Here's a rundown on the Scotland Yard and the Interpol findings. Subject, Janos Skorzny, born in Krajewski, Romania, 1899. Now, now, wait just a minute. You trying to tell me this guy's over 70 years old? Come on, Bernie, your boys have come up with the wrong man. Like hell we have. These facts have been triple-checked and confirmed. Now, look, I've been up all night, and I'm pretty tired. Now, do you want it or don't you? All right, Bernie, just take it easy. Let's hear it. All right. Skorzny's father died in 1923. He left somewhere between 75 and 100 million dollars. At this time, he began to travel, and he became known throughout Eastern Europe as a big lover of nightlife. Now, we don't have a lot more on him before World War II. However, Scotland Yard reports that he showed up in England just in time for the German Blitz. I'm sure Mr. Kolchek will find the following facts of interest such formality from a man who always guzzles my beer. While in England, he passed himself off as Dr. Paul Belasco, specialist in hematology research. His work involved freshly killed air raid victims from various London emergency rooms. As a matter of fact, at his residence in Shaftville Court, he installed several kinds of sumps, tubs, and an extremely large commercial meat freezer. In 1948, he turned up in Canada still as Dr. Belasco, and further checking uh, made his presence known in almost every place along the U.S.-Canadian border where rioting and violence and a number of dead bodies were found. We believe he left Canada for Vegas April 19th under the name of Detective Constable Alan Hensley. Now, because of his British citizenship, he is an international fugitive. So my people are very interested in him. 
This is no longer just a local matter. Now, gentlemen, the one constant that has shown up in all of our reports is that Skorzny's travels have always been accompanied by a number of unexplained killings, many of which have one thing in common, a massive loss of blood. So, if Skorzny is not the vampire of Mr. Kolchak's theories, he is certainly the suspect of multiple homicides extending back some 30 years. Uh, Mr. Jenks, you seem to be running this show. Uh, could I have meant to say something? Mr. Kolchak, you have the... Kolchak, now you keep it short. I was at the hospital yesterday, and a lot of things were happening that you just simply cannot explain away. Sheriff, your own men shot at him, some at point-blank range. How come it didn't even slow him down? How come a man over 70 years old can outrun a police car? How come the same man when slugged in the head doesn't even bleed? Now, I saw those gashes in his head, and whatever it was was trickling down from those wounds, it was clear. It oh, was yeah, not this guy's blood. got a motor mouth. Can't we shut him up? No, let him hang himself. Then we'll finally be rid of him. So far, he has killed four, probably five women. Now, the coroner said that those bite marks on the throat were made by human teeth. He practically confirmed the fact that he actually drank their blood. Now, no, 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 wait, now, whatever the scores he may be, he seemed to be functioning as if he were a vampire. Now, you can go on operating as if he were an ordinary man. Uh, that's up to you. But I know that the only way you're going to get him is if you proceed under the assumption that he's a real live vampire. Oh, now, oh, wait, oh, now, now, wait, now the research that I've been able to find... Wait a minute, minute Kolchak, have you lost your mind? Can you imagine the total blind panic this town would be in if the public were told we were actually looking for a vampire? Not to mention the irreparable damage it would do to the image of law enforcement in Vegas. Ah, that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's it! Boy, I really can't believe that you guys are so afraid of appearing stupid that you'll ignore the only possible way of nailing him. You listen, Kolchak, and you listen good. We'll handle this by ourselves and without undue public observation. No undue public observation. You've blown it already. Look, look here. Look what's appeared in my paper today. People are going to be calling for a grand jury investigation. You can't stop the rumors. Go over. Sit down. I don't care what's been printed in the newspapers. This man is still classified as an ordinary maniac and he'll be settled by standard police procedures. Oh, boy. And you better start cooperating with that fact, Kolchak, or you want to get your pushy-tushy kicked right out of town. You dig? Yes, sir, I dig. But just remember, the next time you blow it, who's got the answers, sir? All right, Ed. Let's get on with it. What have you got? Well, the two departments combined have 650 men on full-time duty. All leaves are canceled, and everyone's working a 16-hour day. Our chopper is going from dusk to dawn. We've got unmarked cars patrolling the casino center and the strip. All roads are blocked, and we're receiving complete cooperation from the highway patrol and the jeep posse. You got it? Got it. Repeat. What did I say? Show every real estate agent in town a picture of this guy's puss and ask him if they sold a house to anybody that looks like him. Good boy, you got it. Now, right. going. now wait a minute, wait a minute. When did I lose this last dollar? Mickey, has the idea of winning ever occurred to you? You know, I have a very strange, unhappy feeling that the police are never going to catch his murderer. I also have another very unhappy feeling. Which is? That this case may be even bigger than I thought it was. Bigger? Well, stranger than. I've seen a lot of weird things in my life, love. I have never, ever seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. You don't tell me that you're finally going to believe. Shh. I don't even want to think about it. Car 14, check out the report of the delays downtown Casino Drive. Go 
May 28, 3.17 a.m., despite the helicopters, the highway patrol, the jeep posse, despite the blocking of every major road and highway, despite the mass coverage of Las Vegas by every available man in both police and sheriff departments, Giano Scorzini was still at large. <laughs> The courthouse conference room had been a scene of chaos for more than three hours now. Messages were still flooding in from every outside unit. Every available man who had taken place in the capture attempt was being debriefed. At the hospital, two officers had died and a third was hovering on the edge. Reports on them were still coming in as the greatest manhunt in the history of Las Vegas continued in vain. Thanks, Bernie. Yeah. Well, what are we going to do? Now, are you willing to listen to my insane idea? Kolchik, get out of here. Oh, Warren, hold it, hold it. Kolchik, you were there, weren't you? Yeah. Every man we've questioned insists not only that scores and he was possessed of incredible strength, but that he was shot more than once during the capture attempt. Oh, I'd say it 30, 40 times. I'm sorry, I'm not buying that. Captain, you have two choices. Either he was shot, or your entire police department is blind. Ed, let's admit it. We had the man, had him cornered, and we couldn't hold him. Let Kolchak have his say. Oh, uh, before I do, is it agreed that in return for my help, you will grant me the exclusive rights to the entire story? Uh, well, let's say it's agreeable if 
we decide to follow your suggestions regarding the suspect. Fine, fine, because if you don't follow my suggestions, you're going to be chasing your suspect till doomsday. Cold check, just get on with it. Of course. Each man in the field is to be issued one of these uh, to be carried uh, in his pocket. This gentleman. Where'd you get that? Well, I have a friend who's got a furniture repair store. I woke him up and had him make it. Each man in the field is to be issued one of these and uh, one of these. Are you suggesting that we pound one of these into Scorzini's chest? No, no, into his heart. There's a legal phrase for that, Kolchak. You might have run into it once or twice in your broad experience. It's called premeditated murder. It's the only way you're going to stop him. You heard your own men. Can they all be wrong? Oh, well, you, uh, you can stop uh, your nighttime chases from now on, too, gentlemen. Uh, the only hope you have is to spot Skorzeny and then track him back to where he lives and wait until sunrise before finishing him off. Uh, he's only vulnerable during the day. At night, he's much too strong. Yes, gentlemen, I hate to say this, <laughs> but it looks as if we have a real live vampire on our hands. Ed. Yes, sir. Warren. Yeah. Tom, I'd like to be in on this, too. Okay, Kolchak, you've got yourself a deal. Conditional. What's that? Put you here, we'll issue the crosses, the mallets, the stakes. The one thing he won't do is depart from established police procedures. If feasible, Scorsini is to be taken alive and held for trial. Trial? That's right, trial. <laughs> trial. All right, in return for what? You'll get the exclusive rights of the story. Good. Uh, when the blackout is lifted. Uh, yeah. Any other conditions? Uh, one more. What's that? If it turns out you're wrong, you're to be out of town in 12 hours. Take it or leave it. All right, I'll take it. Uh, because I know I'm right. And uh, you know I'm right. Right. Ciao! I'll take Manhattan, the Bronx and Staten Island, too. Watch out, you great big, wonderful, big apple coal shacks coming back. Yeah! As Manhattan's coming here, wait till I get to a van. Get out of the van. Get out. It's me, Crawford! What are you doing driving off with me in the back seat? What are you doing in my back seat? I wanted to talk to you. I saw your car parked here, so I got in to wait for you, and I got sleepy. You got sleepy. Hey! I think I found the house. I told Crawford to give me 30 minutes before telling Jenks where I was. 
That way I could get to see the house alone for a while and also keep the police from arriving before dawn, which I knew they'd do if they got the chance, no matter what I told them.
Jimmy Forbes. Shh, shh, shh. Relax, son. His own private blood bank. Wow.
think they'll print it? I know they will. We've got an agreement. Hey, you look kind of tired. Do you want me to drive you to the uh, office? Come on, hush your bike. Hush your bike. Yeah. Yeah, I want to finish this in time for the special kitchen. Hey, why don't you stop working nights? Oh, Carl, not that again. And marry me. What? Well, you're a good cooker and a good kisser. Why not? <laughs> oh, baby, you're gonna love New York City. Honey, after this story hits the news services with my byline... Oh, well, us married? Yes, us <laughs> married! <laughs> Don't look now, baby. But Cold Shack's coming back in style. <laughs> There you are, Vincenzo. And if I do say so myself, it's sensational. I'm sure it is, Carl. You're going to put in the special edition. Right. Yeah, with pictures. Uh-huh. Yeah, and the new services. Okay, fine. Let's get into you, Vincenzo. You sick or something? I think this is all fine, Carl. Fine. Uh, Jenks has been trying to reach you. Yeah, what do you want? He wants to see you over at the DA's office. Why don't you run over there now? Yeah. Uh, phone, Jack. You're one hell of a reporter. Thank you, sir. And a bright good morning to all of you. Bernie, what did you, uh... Is your name Carl Kolchak, and do you reside in the city of Las Vegas? Well, you know my name's Carl Kolchak. Well, what's going on? Well, Carl Kolchak, you're under arrest on the charge of murder. The state requires that you be informed that you have the right to remain silent. Have you <laughs> seen... <laughs> no. Oh, no. No chance. You're not going to pull that one on me. <laughs> no. Kolchak! You are under arrest. All right, Payne, just what kind of a dirty deal is this? You have a very short memory, Cole Jack. A few hours ago, Sheriff Butcher himself saw you actually pound a wooden stake through a man's heart with this mallet. A man wanted for questioning. Questioning, mind you. He hadn't been arrested. He hadn't even been charged. You broke up our stakeout, and after we were kind enough to invite you to go along, you just charged in there in front of us and killed Janos Gorzeny before we had a chance to do anything. Well, you were even ranting and raving about this Gorsny being some kind of a vampire, and you had to save the world. And that, Mr. Kolchak, is murder one. Now, if you plead insanity, you might get lucky, but I promise you this. You'll be committed to an asylum for the rest of your life. I pull your fat out of the fire, and you do this. Carl, will you just sit down a minute and listen to them? Bernie, you were there! Carl! Just listen. Uh, this is your story, Kolchak. It's already being printed. This morning, shortly before sunrise, Las Vegas Sheriff deputies under the command of Sheriff Warren A. Butcher, 45, surrounded the home of Jano Skorzeny, a fugitive from a federal warrant, and in a pitch gun battle, were forced to kill him. Never. You'll never get away with it. What's to stop me? You're gonna stop yourself, Kolchak. Because if you open your mouth, we'll find you, bring you back, use this warrant, and put you away forever. Pick him up, Kolchak. Pick him up and get out of town. Now, we'll take care of your back rent. I want to call Gail. She's not there, Carl. What have you done with her? Nothing. We just asked the young lady if she'd be good enough to leave town. 
She's an undesirable element, Kolchak, and we don't want undesirable elements in Las Vegas. Carl, there's nothing I can do. Carl, you, you let me know where you end up, huh? Yeah, sure, Bernie. I'll keep in touch. So all the loose ends have been gathered together and tied into a pretty knot right around the neck of guess who. After I left town, I began putting notices in the personal columns of newspapers from San Francisco to St. Louis. Until I ran out of money, that is. So far, I've received no answers, but I, I'll keep trying, even though I don't think I'll ever find Gail Foster again. Maybe it's just as well. So that's it. The book's finished. And now you'll have to judge for yourself. I must warn you, however, if you try to verify this account, you will find it quite impossible. Item, in Washington, D.C., there was no longer a file listing the suspect under his true name or any of his alleged aliases. Item, in Las Vegas, all of those who were involved have either left town, aren't talking, or are dead. I haven't had a decent night's sleep since all this happened. And now you might find it difficult, too. Because there is still one fact that cannot be buried. After the death of Janos Skorzeny, he and all of his victims were immediately cremated. Why? Remember the legend? All those who die from the bite of the vampire will return as a vampire, unless destroyed first. So think about it and try to tell yourself, wherever you may be, in the quiet of your home, in the safety of your bed, try to tell yourself it couldn't happen here.
This is the story behind the most incredible series of murders to ever occur in the city of Seattle, Washington. You never read about them in your local newspapers or heard about them on your local radio or television station. Why? Because the facts were watered down, torn apart and reassembled. In a word, falsified. Saturday, April 1st, approximately 2.35 a.m. Marissa, one of the three belly dancers at Omar's Tent, a well-known bar in the Pioneer Square area. She was through for the night and on her way to St. James Street, where she could catch the 3 a.m. bus that would take her to her small apartment in the Shoreline Park area. Anxious to get home, she planned to take a shower and go right to bed. She never made it. Nights later, in the bar room of the Seattle Press Club, one Tony Vincenzo by name, city editor by profession, bilious grouch by disposition, renewed acquaintance with a dear old comrade of the Fourth Estate. Hi, Charlie. Mr. Vincenzo, how are you? Okay. Good. The usual, Mr. Vincenzo? Yeah, yeah. Where you been living, in a cave? The world outside, a world of facts. Stumble on, take a peek at him. Get your brains out of hibernation. Oh, no. Come on, you can't expect to believe this. This doesn't make any sense at all. What's the difference if it makes sense or not? If it's true, you're supposed to be a newsman, aren't you? Not a critic. Well, I yeah. am. Yeah, take a look at this, then. Just take this one. Take, take a look on. around that corner. See if there isn't someone there that looks like he just came from a road company performance on the front page. And don't lecture me about the responsibility of the press, you cabbie chat. I knew more about the press the day I was born than you do now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, can you read English, or do I have to tell you what it says? See, right there. V-A-M-P-I-R-E. -E. Vampire. That's what it says right there. Can you read the official coroner's report? Look at that. Bl blood drained from a victim's... There's nothing wrong with me. Vincenzo! Hello, Carl. What are you doing here in Seattle? What did I do in Las Vegas? Well, you fired me. That's what you did in Las Vegas. No, no, no. I didn't fire you. Well, in that case, then, you can hire me. Right, Vincenzo? Get this straight, Mr. Kolchak. No carnival or hoopla tactics on this paper. This isn't Fun Town, USA. This is Seattle. We have standards here. We mind our P's and Q's. We hew precisely to the mark. Uh, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Crossbinder. You can count on me minding your P's and Q's. Uh, yes, sir. So that's what happened to Cotton Mather, huh? Don't underestimate him. Maybe old, but his fangs are potent. <laughs> so, what's my first assignment? What's the matter? Okay. Murder one, three days ago. A belly dancer named Marissa. She was strangled in an alley. 
Tuesday, April 4th. For stop police headquarters to introduce myself and see if any later information had come in about the Ethel Parker killing. There was nothing new. No useful leads given by the victim's friends, acquaintances, or family. Standard medical examiner's report. So far, the murder was a one-way street to nowhere. I'd like to take... I said like make an appointment with my secretary. Well, you're going to have to make one. Captain, I'd like to make a little uh, uh, question. Hey, Captain, I'd like... Wait a minute. What's the matter? I want to talk to the captain. Second stop, Omar's tent. No leads. Ethel Parker never mixed with customers, had no known enemies, kept her problems to herself. Unmarried, all her relatives in Massachusetts, she'd left the mainstream of life without making a ripple. Third stop, the apartment of Charisma Beauty. Given name, Gladys Weems, one of the two other belly dancers at Omar's tent. Charisma Beauty? Who are you? Who's there, Wilma? Miss Beauty? Yes, I am. Uh, excuse me? I beg your pardon? My name is Cole Shack, and I'm with the Daily Chronicle. I'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Would you like to talk? Uh, no, 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 thank you very much. What I'd like to ask you is, uh... She was... Uh, Something less than helpful, and I soon departed. Made a bit uneasy by the looks directed at me by her husband, Wilma Crankheimer. Fourth stop, the floating premises of Louise Harper, last of the belly dancing trio at the supper club. Your hair is on? Uh, Louise Harper. Oh, hi. I'm sorry I can't talk to you now. I'm late for class. Yeah, I, uh... Listen, if you want to sell me something, come back later. I must tell you, though, I really don't have any money for extras, so you just be wasting your time. Yeah, but the, uh, Listen, I, uh... I'd like to talk to you. I am so late for class. Professor Graham will kill yeah, me. But... My grades are not too good as it is. I, How uh... I'm ever going to graduate, I will never know. There simply is not enough time to do all the things that may, I've got to do. May, may, may I introduce myself? My name is Cole Shack of the Daily Chronicle. When could I ask you some questions about Ethel Parker? You'll have to come by the club. That's just about the only time I have to talk to you. I am so late, I know he's going to flunk me. Well, thanks for the information. Whee! <laughs> Don't mention it! You know there's been a murder, don't you? I also know that Seattle is the Northwest's largest seaport. Men come and go like the tide, and the murderer is probably in Yokohama by now. She was wrong. He was still in Seattle, working up his list of victims. <laughs> Cocktail waitress, Gail Manning. Disposed of sometime after 2 a.m. on the morning of Thursday, April 6th, a block and a half from the first murder. Uh, Captain, Captain, what do you intend to do about it? Who are you anyway? Uh, my name is Kolchak, sir, with the Daily Chronicle. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions just on this. Just back. Would, just, when you get in your car, will you wait a minute? Listen, uh, Captain, I got a lot of problems I got to take care of. Strangulation, neat and quick. No new elements was all they told us until the medical examiner's report the next afternoon. In attendance, Captain Roscoe Schubert of the Seattle Police and his staff. Holding forth, Dr. Christopher Webb of the County Medical Examiner's Office. Uh, <clears throat> checking underneath the victim's hairline, we located what appears to be a needle puncture near the base of the skull, from which a small amount of blood was removed. Was there any puncture or loss of blood in Ethel Parker? Uh, we haven't had a chance to check on the puncture yet, but there was apparently a slight decrease in normal blood content. How slight? Well, that's hard to say. Maybe six or seven cc's. Why wasn't it reported? The amount of loss seemed insignificant at the time. But not now. You have a point. Uh, just a minute, Doctor. So who is this clown? Carl I've never seen him before. What? Call Shank, Daily Chronicle. Don't you remember, Captain? Oh, yeah, yeah. How can I forget? All right, now, Mr. Kolchak, may we continue? Certainly. Uh, thank you very much. Go ahead, Doctor. As long as we get all the facts this time. 
Dissatisfied by what I had heard at the medical examiner's report, I paid a little visit to the morgue and found myself a chatty attendant with a taste for scotch. What he told me made chopped liver of the needle puncture and loss of blood and explained why they hadn't let me look too closely at Gail Manning the night before. Well, uh, no, 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 thank you. Thank you, no, no, thank you very much. You go right on ahead, though. Now, look, right off the top, you know we can't link these two killings unless we know whether Ethel Parker has a needle puncture, too. She has. And that's not all. You know something the medical examiner doesn't? Mm -hmm. What? First, you owe me ten bucks for a bottle of scotch. Mm -hmm. What? Yep. Bought for one anecdotal morgue attendant. Okay, keep talking. Hurry up. Uh-huh. Yeah, Ethel Parker not only had a needle puncture in the back of her skull uh, and loss of blood, she also had a broken neck. Well, that's not so unusual in the case of a straggling. Gail Manning also had a broken neck. So what? Maybe I ought to give it to you as a morgue attendant told me. He said that the killer had to be an incredibly strong man. Not only were the necks broken, they were crushed. Oh, read on, read on. Oh, no, no, wait a minute! That's what the man said. On the throats of both victims, there was a residue of rotted flesh as if they had been strangled by a dead man. Friday, April 7th, 10.21 p.m. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, but Louise Harper's hips could move as fast as her mouth. of the East. And now, the world-famous Charisma Beauty. Now I'm dead, Charisma. Why should I do that? I like them. Princess of the East? No. Dimwit of the West. Listen, I just can't talk to you right now. I just, I've got to know algebra. Well, I'm great at figures. I bet you are. Go away. You know, if I could find a way not to eat, I sure could save a lot of time. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's pick up talking where we left off. I mean, about the guys, uh, thank you, Charlie, yeah, about the about the guys who come to see you dance, the regulars, you know. Did you find any, uh, any strange ones in there, any odd ones, any weirdos? Uh -huh. They're all weird. I mean, they sit there and stare at you with these big, glassy eyes. Any of them could be the strangler, for all I know. What's that? Oh, that's the underground tour. The what? The underground tour. It goes down underneath the Seattle. Oh, you're kidding. Hmm. Yes, there's ruins underneath the streets here, what they call old Seattle. Isn't that right, Wilma? Oh, I don't know. Here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I just love these sandwiches. I was talking about the underground, wasn't I? Yeah, you were, honey. There was this big fire back in 18-something or other, and for some strange reason I don't know about, they built it all back up, twice as big as it was before. Mm. Isn't that right, Wilma? Come on, Gladys, it's almost showtime. 
Although research was never one of my favorite pastimes, I'd called on the services of one Titus Barry, guardian of the secrets of Seattle buried in the morgue of the Daily Chronicle. Here we go. Thanks. Most welcome. I envy you. You do? Research. That's where the joy lies. Joy. And the fascination. Let the others scurry about gathering their contemporary bits of gossip. This is where the meat is found. Meat? Yes. For instance, no one has yet mentioned the distinct resemblance between this current series of strangulations and another series in the year 1951. No, was it 52? Yeah, how similar. Oh, extremely similar. Really? He wasn't exaggerating. On March 27th, 1952, one Myra Johns was discovered strangled in an alley in a Pioneer Square area. On March 30th, a second strangulation took place in the same area. On April 2nd, a third. April 5th, a fourth. By April 14th, six women had been strangled, all of them in that area. The stories intimated that certain, quote, bizarre details, unquote, had been repressed by police officials. I wondered what they were. I hardly think we can say we have the same killer now as in 1952. Read on. Again? Again. Incredibly strong and had the rotted features of a corpse? Those are exact quotes, word for word, from Man of Simon Action in 1952. Oh, you know I can't print this. Why not? If you don't know the answer to that, Kolchak, I don't know. I came to Seattle for some peace and quiet. What do I get? You again in another crazy story. Yeah, well, we'll soon see if it's crazy or not. How, asked the red-eyed editor, knowing Because that. if it is the same killer, he hasn't stopped killing. Sunday, April 9th, 1.42 a.m. Joyce Gabriel, on her way home from a late date, didn't know it was a bad idea to be in the Pioneer Square area late at night. Another one. I just settled down, Miss Gabriel. I never saw anything like that in my life. I, I, I don't know why he didn't chase me after, after he killed her. I just, I just, you know, I, I ran as fast as I could until I, I, I saw for you. I, now listen, I'm telling you for the last time, I'm getting sick and tired of you butting into my business. Now, will you please let me ask the questions, Mr. Kolchak? I certainly can. All right. Certainly. What did he look like? Are you deaf? Now, look, get rid of that tape recorder, too. Now, what did he look like? Oh, God, I hope I never see a face like that again. He looked like a dead man. Like a what? Like a dead man. No, sir, don't, don't say it. I don't want to hear it. What about the broken necks and the rotted flesh and the throats of the three I victims? I told you I didn't want to hear it. Besides, not official. Not official? Who cares whether it's official or not? Look, you I'm, know it and I know it. I'll buy the possibility that some guy, a killer that strangled the six women in 1952. But a man, Carl, not some kind of super dead man. That's the way he has been described more than once. I don't care if he's been described that way more than twice. Let me finish my life. Where are you going? of the killer. Listen to this. I intend to walk the streets of the Pioneer Square area every night from now on. Just let him try to kill me if he dares. He may be sick, but he's not crazy. Jack, 
because you had the thoughtfulness to put my name in your story in the 1952 strangulations. What, uh, what is it? A burning curiosity impelled me to look further back into our files to see if there had been any other strangulations of that nature. 1931? You gotta be kidding. Here it was again, March 29th through April 16th. Six strangulations, certain bizarre information repressed by the authorities. Although a reporter named Jimmy Stacks, God bless him, nosed around until he uncovered the unofficial information that some of the victims were missing some blood and that the killer was supposed to be some kind of superman. Women. You notice that? Always women. Fascinating. Yeah, that's the word, Mr. B. Let's see, 1970, 1952, that's 21 years. 1952 to 1931, that's 21 years. That's right, I hadn't noticed that. That's very observant of you, Mr. Kolchak. Can you be thinking when I'm thinking? Let's have a look. Mr. Barry. Mr. Kolchak. Shall we try for 1889? I refuse to read it. <laughs> Just, just read the first line. Come on. Just the first line. Come on, do yourself a treat. Come on. Come on. Five identical sets of murders every 21 years since 1889? Identical? Identical. Oh, come on, Colchat. Almost identical. There may be more than five, too. The record stopped in 1887 when the Chronicle was founded. I'm going down to Olympia tomorrow and check out the. Uh, oh, don't, state rush, don't rush into that. Wait, wait, wait. Read, 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 the, read the 1910 eyewitness description. I'll read it to you here. Oh, it's great. The maniac had the strength of 10 men and the face of a corpse. Cheekbones protruding through the flesh. Isn't that great? Hold it, hold it, hold it. Just hold it. You really and truly expect me to print that story with a corpse that. It's been running around, strangling people and brushing their necks for the past 84 years? Oh. Because the police refused to release the sketch their own artist had made, I talked Vincenzo into hiring an artist of our own. His jaw was heavier, I think. That's closer. But more bone was showing through. Like this? Yes. Is that what he looked like? That's what I saw. Monday, April 10th, 2.07 p.m. Fourth of July came to Seattle early that year. All the fireworks exploding at the police headquarters. Ninety percent of them directed at me and Vincenzo. You know what I call that? Irresponsible yellow journalism. Fast buck journalism. The kind of seamy journalism one might expect to find in some second-rate metropolis. The sordid brand of journalism, which is based not on the public wheel, no, but on the private cash register. Psychologists call it deja vu, the distinct impression of having had the same experience before. That's what it was, all right, in spades. Item, we had no right to throw the public into a panic. Translation, tourist season was coming up and Seattle couldn't survive without it. Item, we had no evidence to support our statement that there might be a connection between the five sets of murders since 1889. Translation, we knew more than we were supposed to. Item, the authorities were going to keep a watchful eye on us, particularly me, from now on. Translation, after a beef hiatus, I had, once more, taken up permanent residence inside a pressure cooker. Permit me to read you a brief memorandum. Quote, any repetition of this morning's front page assault on the mind and senses will result in the instant dismissal of all responsible persons. Unquote. Signed, God. You're almost right. 
How can I let this happen to me again? How could I do it? I don't understand. Will you wait a minute? Will you just wait a minute? We wasted a lot of time. We wasted an awful lot of time fighting tooth and nail in Las Vegas about the obvious. There is no such thing as a vampire. That's what everyone kept saying, and the women kept dying. Now, let's not play that stupid game again. Besides, it's a great story. It's a fabricated story full of screwball speculation. Fabricated speculation? What, have you been sitting on your brain? Just, just give me the facts, Kolchak, or stay away from me. Just the facts. Step number one in my fact-finding project took me to the main library, where I spent the rest of the evening checking through their microfilm collection of Seattle's newspapers. The murder trail apparently came to an end in 1889. But I found out something very interesting. As near as I could make it out, every set of murders had taken place over a period of 18 days, which meant that our killer, whoever or whatever he was, only had a week and a day to find his last three victims. That night, about 11.45, he reduced the number to two. Hold it, mister. Identification, please. Yeah, identification, sure, right, uh, right here. tour of Seattle's forgotten city beneath the modern streets of Seattle. That mouthful was devised by the man I'm about to introduce, author, journalist, Mr. Bill Spidell. Thank you, young man. Welcome to Seattle's underground tours, folks. Before I go on, I want to tell you about Mother Damnable. After completely striking out of my efforts to get Schubert to return my film of last night's wipeout of the Seattle police, I decided to try another angle. Make room for the underground. I telephoned my belly dancing undergraduate friend and asked her to attend an afternoon tour of the underground with me. Confession of a Newsman, Chapter One. Her being with me had nothing to do with the story. Those kids uh, from Seattle High School spent five successive 
Saturdays, back in the spring of 1965. Cleaning up no less than 10 tons of debris down here so that people like yourselves wouldn't break your necks while walking around. All right, watch your step through here. You gentlemen can help the ladies, huh? Twice a day when the uh, tides came in, the sewer system backed up and came right in with it, flooding every water closet, turning it into a fountain. Now, I tell you, kids in those days weren't raised on Dr. Spock. They were raised in the tide table. Hey, watch your step. Let's go this way. It was like another world down there, a world of yesterday. The sidewalks and storefronts just as they'd been left after the fire in 1889. Windows built to admit the light, admitting only darkness now. Ground floors of office buildings now, the unused cellars of those buildings. The tomb of old Seattle just beneath the living streets of what Seattle is today. I'm all right. Listen. Have you seen anybody else around here who wasn't with the tours? Yeah. Yeah? Who? You too. Oh, funny. Very funny. Well, if you do see someone or uh, something around here, you uh, get in touch with me at uh, this number. I'll give you 20 bucks. Uh, here's a down payment. <laughs> I could live three months on that. Five bucks. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. <clears throat> on me. I still don't think it's a good idea for you to be working nights. You know, I've seen this nut in action. Oh, terrific. You're going to pick up my tuition? It's very funny. Very funny. I just don't get it. What does it go between killings? I mean, we didn't find anything down in the underground. No. I don't understand it. How can he run like a track star, have superhuman strength, and look like a stiff? Now, what does he do with all that blood? I mean, it's like some kind of recurring nightmare. It's all happened to me before. What are you talking about? Well, last year in Las Vegas, when I was working for Tony Vincenzo, I uncovered a series of murders that turned out to have been committed by a vampire. <laughs> no, a real vampire. 
A real out of the coffin at night go for the jugular type vampire. You don't believe me? Mm -mm. No, well, neither did the cops up there, neither did the FBI, neither did Tony Vicenzo, until finally they had to. Well, as it turned out, however, they put a cap on my story, prevented me from writing about which I had seen with my own eyes by hanging a murder rap over my head. Murder? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, finally drove a wooden stake into the vampire's heart. I don't know. I'm beginning to wonder whether maybe it isn't them. Maybe it's me. Listen, I think I know somebody you should see. There's this lady who's a teacher at the university. Well, she teaches anthropology. And she's a buff on just, I mean, every crazy subject there is in the world. Yeah? Ghosts, demons, and vampires, and ghouls. You know, you just name it. You probably won't be too crazy about her, but she's got to be the one you talk to. Yeah? What's her name? Professor Crabwell. What? How can a man over a hundred years old retain his vitality? Is it possible? If it were possible, I'd be sitting here an 80-year-old sex pot. Uh, however, staying young was not their purpose. Alchemy was conceived as an exalted notion, man at one with the universe. And will you please sit down? Yes, yes, of course. These men led Spartan lives, living in the most humble of quarters, eating the most humble of foods. The Count Saint Germain, for instance, existed on a diet which consisted solely of oatmeal, groats, white meat or chicken, and a little wine. It just seems to me that a diet like that would make a man old before his time. On the contrary. He remained young for a number of years, in addition to which he was said to have possessed almost superhuman strength. Tell me, what other, uh, what other ingredients are in this elixir of life? Milk or meat, celandine or honey, red wine vinegar, hair, sweat, blood. What kind of blood? What do you mean, what kind of blood? Human blood, of course. What are you smiling at? Hi there. Got a moment? What are you doing here? Just wanted to talk with you, man. What about? The elixir of life. <sighs> Go to journalism school, my father said. It's a good, sound, down-to-earth profession. Don't you want to hear this? What I like to do is raise tulips for a living, but there's not too much of a demand. Suppose an elixir of life could actually be produced. How do you think it would work? I mean, do you think, do you think that that one treatment of it would cause everlasting youth? Or do you think that, that uh, well, periodic treatments might be required, say... Wait a minute, wait a minute, don't tell me, let me guess. Every 21 years? Good guess. Now, suppose at the end of this 21-year period, the man who took the magic elixir began looking a little uh, moldy, you know, kind of like what he really did look like, actually, a 100-year-old man. Suppose he had to make a new batch of the elixir and had to make it within a period of 18 days. Suppose that the one ingredient he didn't have was blood. Very good. Suppose he had to go out late every night to get that blood. Suppose he got it from the basis of his victim's skulls with a hypodermic needle. And suppose he was so strong that when he strangled his victims, he crushed their necks. And suppose his fingertips were starting to decompose and left fragments of them on the women's throats. And suppose you flap your arms and fly right out that door. And suppose you check on the victim and you discover what the word fat means, Cole Jack. Fat! Fat! As I rode home from work that night, I wondered where the killer was and if my theory about him was true. Partly true, or, as Vincenzo would have it, factless, hopeless, and useless. I wondered when and how he'd get his fifth victim, since the entire area was being guarded so closely now. I didn't have to wonder long.
April 13th, 125 a.m. The dressing room in Omar's tent. Charisma Beauty was plain old Gladys Weems again. Dead, strangled with a broken neck, blood syringed from the base of her skull. Wilma Crankheimer was still in shock. So was Louise Harper. She had found the body after her performance. And I wasn't doing so well myself. Captain, I've got to talk to you about something. Hey, wait a minute. Come on. This is very important, Captain. I'm sorry. Captain Schubert is very busy. You yeah, can't well, go I got to see him. I said you cannot go I'm in going there. there, sweetheart. What's, What's going, going on here? I told him you were busy, sir. I've been trying to see you since 1.30 this morning, and I'm not going to leave until I do. It's all right, Sheila. I'm sorry, sir. It's all right, Sheila. you got to put police women on the waterfront streets at night. Do I, Mr. Yeah, Patrick? you do. you got five days in which to catch the killer. Otherwise, he's going to disappear. Oh, is he, Mr. Colton? Yeah, he is. He is. Every 21 years, since 1889, he has killed six women in 18 days precisely. Precisely, Mr. Colton? Precisely. Precisely. Well, no doubt we lack your eagle-eyed perception, but somehow we fail to see the exact precise pattern you keep babbling about. Now, in 1889, there was no evidence that the murders were committed over an 18-day period, or, for that matter, that they were even related. You yeah, check? Yes, we do a little research, too, sometimes. Now, to continue, in 1910, there was blood loss reported in only three of the victims. Yeah, what about the description the of the... The description of the murder was made by a mental defective in his cups and... What about the 1952 descriptions? Were those made by a mental defective in his cups? He was a bank president! In 1952, there were eight murders committed during an 18-day period. Now, what does that do to your theory? Two of them by stabbing, which invalidates... And after the sixth strangulation, an eyewitness described the murderer as being, quote, rather handsome, unquote. Oh, uh, you mean you missed that? Well, I... Uh... Well, the witness obviously made a mistake. I mean, he had to. Well, did he, huh? Yeah. Tell me something, then. If it's the same killer, why no signs of rotted flesh on the throat of last night's victim? Um, and one last question. Why am I wasting my time on you? Facts obviously mean nothing to you at all. There is one last fact, Captain. By next Tuesday, that killer's gonna disappear for 21 years. And the way your police have got the Pioneer Square area bottled up, he isn't even gonna show his face. Which face is that, huh? The rotted one of your so-called super killer your newspaper saw fit to print? So-called? So I saw that so-called super killer wipe up the streets with your so-called police force. I had pictures to prove it that you wouldn't let me print. Tell me something, Kolchak. How long have you been in Seattle? What difference does that make? What have I got to do? How long have you been with the Chronicle? Oh, a little less than two weeks. A little less than two weeks, yeah, huh? Well, and in that brief time, you have ascertained exactly how we should conduct this case. Well, I've been a reporter for 22 years. And I've been a police officer for 30. Well, then why don't you retire? Listen, I don't like you, Mr. Kolchak. You might say I dislike you monumentally. Now, you have barged around this building as though it were your own private club. You've interfered with police officers while they were trying to perform their duty. You've strewn the streets of Seattle with a journalistic garbage. You've stepped on toes, muscled in, pushed, usurped, and generally conducted yourself with all the aplomb of a one-man Gestapo. Gestapo? Yes, Gestapo. Now listen, if I see or hear from you again for quite some time, I promise you I'll personally have you thrown in jail and get your arm off my clock. I'm telling you, you've only got five days left. And I'm telling you to get out and stay out. Cease, mister. Cease, desist, and vanish, or else. At least search the underground. The killer's down there. That's where he isn't. That... The underground was searched. Nothing at all was found. Sheila! Yes, we did that without consulting you. I hope that's all right, Mr. Kolchak. Sheila, show Mr. Kolchak the door. Good day, sir. Police department, didn't I? Yeah, didn't so, I? So what? So, so, so Schubert's office just called Grossbinder. Grossbinder called me. And once again, thanks to you, I'm flying on a griddle. Why? Why? Are you for real? 
You barge into Schubert's office, you tell him how to run his case, you tell him he's suppressing the news, and you ask why? He is suppressing the news. He doesn't know how to run the case. The killer is down there, Tony. He is down there well, what in did they the get underground. Him out of there? Because he is hidden away someplace that nobody knows. Then how the heck can they get out of there? By breaking open the walls. I don't know. Listen. Crossbinder's got some influence in town, hasn't he? What about it? You have got to talk him in to pressuring the police, forcing them to do what I want them to do. <laughs> you know what you just said? Well, of course I know what I just said. I just said it, didn't I? No, you don't know. It's finally happened, Kolchak. You've gone schizoid. No. You'll be wearing robes in the crown no, next. No, 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 I'll tell you what's finally happened, Tony. You have lost your guts. You have sold out. Sold out? Sold out. Why, you miserable, egocentric... You are off the story. I am what? You heard me. You are off the story. You know something, Tony? You're getting old. You're getting very old. Out. Out! Out! Get out! Just one small item, Mr. Kolchak. Mark Twain. Fifth paragraph down. Fifth paragraph. Down to three. Oh, yeah. Mr. Twain noted with typical dryness of tone that he had a most intriguing conversation with, with, uh, with a local physician who claimed that physical immortality. Oh, this is very good, Mr. Barry. Very good. And physical mortality was not only possible, but probable, indeed practical. Mr. Twain remarked that. Yes, the physician's name is Dr. Richard Malcolm. You wouldn't have anything on this Richard Malcolm, would you? Just one small item. Dr. Richard Malcolm was a member of the original staff of the West Side Mercy Hospital when it opened in 1882. There's the original story and photograph. The Civil War? He was a surgeon in the Union Army. <sighs> Is this hospital still standing? Oh, I don't believe so, Mr. Kolchak. Uh, I, uh... I think there's a clinic there now. I took a fast trip to the clinic, hoping they might have the record files from Westside Mercy Hospital stashed away in their cellar somewhere. I asked Mr. Barry to keep checking his own records while I was gone and find out what else he could about Dr. Richard Malcolm. I never had to search the cellar for those records. I found my answer just inside the lobby door. Here. Tell him to get here right away. Now you get down from there this instant, sir. Malcolm Richards, MD, the doctor's saint of the waterfront, founder of the Richards Free Clinic. Also known as Richard Malcolm, MD, late of the Union Army. Our killer from time. This is dreadful, Mr. Kolchak. On the contrary, Mr. Barry. There he is, officer. Tony. It is to be regretted, Mr. Kolchak, that leg irons and mouth blocks were outlawed some years back. Now, will you wait a minute, please? Will you take these things off? I warned you, Kolchak. Congratulations, Kolchak. You have plumbed a new depth, the desecration of a saint. For heaven's sake, I did not invent the resemblance between Dr. Malcolm Richards and Dr. Richard Malcolm. I did not invent the fact that that West Side Mercy Hospital, which Dr. Richard Malcolm was a staff member, is on the same spot as the Malcolm Richards Clinic. Why not an expose on Dr. Schweitzer, Mr. Kolchak? Or the lowdown on Mahatma Gandhi? As for this eternal youth garbage, I hate it. Yeah, well, I can see why. What did you say? Uh, now, hold on. We're not here for any personal vituperation. You know that word? What? Vituperation. That's what I said. I pronounce it right. <laughs> 
Now listen, Kolchak, you've been arrested. You're about one one hundredth of an inch of being thrown in jail. Well, there he is. Now, who's this? Mr. Barry, come in, come in, come in. Yes, I've been waiting for you. Come on. Yes, yes. Do you, uh, did you, did you, did you, did you, did you, did you get it? Yes, I thought perhaps... Uh... Well, you, well, you thought, well, you thought right, Mr. Barry. <laughs> Who is this man? Don't you know him? He works for you. Uh, down in research, sir, for 35 years. Good God. Yeah, and research, of course, being the meat of it. Yeah, here we are. Mr. Richard Malcolm lived in New York City until 1868 when he moved to Seattle. Oh, very good, Mr. Barry, very good. Several months before he left uh, New York City, that is, six women were strangled over a period of 18 days, precisely. Their larynxes were crushed and their, their uh, necks were broken. Two of them had small wounds on the base of their skull. 1868, I might add, is exactly 21 years before the first group of Seattle killings, Mr. Vincenzo. Item, following the fire of 1889, in which the wife, stepson, and daughter uh, died of smoke insula inhalation, uh, Dr. Richard Malcolm disappeared. 1889, as we know, just happens to be the year in which the first group of six killings occurred, Mr. Vincenzo. Yes, in 1910, doc, uh, Dr. Malcolm Richards appeared in the by now defunct Westside Mercy Hospital, of which, as noted, Dr. Richard Malcolm was formerly a member of the staff, and built his clinic over the original site. 1910, by coincidence, just happens to be the year in which the second group of six killings occurred, Mr. Vincenzo. Oh, Jack. Again, more broken necks and more missing blood. Now listen, Kolchak. Jack. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. In 1931, following reports that he had developed some kind of a, quote, strange degenerative skin disease, unquote, Dr. Malcolm Richards disappeared. Oh, 1931, just by coincidence, happens to be the year in which the third group of similar uh, killings occurred, Mr. Vincenzo. Your oh, photos, photos. Do you, do you have any photographs? Yeah. Yeah. Did you get some? Yeah. Oh, smart, smart. Yeah, you'll uh, excuse the uh, clumsiness of the hands, but my wrists are slightly encumbered by your bracelets. Now, this photograph of Dr. Richard Malcolm and the uh, slightly doctored photograph of Dr. Malcolm Richards are identical down to the white scar above the right eyebrow. Huh? Now, this photograph was taken during the Civil War when Dr. Richard Malcolm was a surgeon with the Union Army. The photograph of Dr. Malcolm Richards was taken in 1926. It showed a man in his 40s. Now, how can a man almost 90 look like a man in his 40s? Facts, gentlemen. Facts. Well? Yes. Well? You shut up. Uh, I mean, uh, well. Fascinating. All right. What are we supposed to do now? Congratulate you? Find him, mister. Go down underground and search for him. You haven't searched enough. And put some police women in the area. Lure him out of his lair. And, Mr. Publisher, you might consider printing the stories. They are news, sir, not hearsay. They are news. That will be enough, Mr. Kolchak. Perhaps, Mr. Kolchak, it would be a good idea if you uh, stepped outside for a moment. Delighted, sir, delighted. If I could get my jewelry removed. All right. Judd, get him out of here. Take the handcuffs off him. Thank you. I just await your decision, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not. Mr. Crossbinder, it'll be done. You can depend on it. Come on, Judd.
Okay, Carl. I don't know how I did it, but I got you off the hook. You did? Yeah. You're a genius, Tony. You're a genius. Now, what, what, about, uh, what about the story? There is no story. What? That's it, Carl. There is no story. From now on, they're going to handle the you, whole you, thing you, the wrong way. You, you, you're going to... Hat? I'll kill him, Kolchak! Don't, didn't they hear me? Didn't they hear what I said? Don't they know what's going to happen? I mean, if they, if they don't lure him out, if they don't get Malcolm out of there, he's going to get his six killed somewhere else, and he's going to disappear for 21 years. Didn't they hear me? Don't they know what's going to happen? They don't know intense panic in the entire city just for your sake, Kolchak. Period! Now, your next assignment, you know, you have your next thing. assignment, courtesy of Mr. Llewellyn you Crossbinder, your next assignment, bright and early tomorrow side. morning, you're covering the Daffodil Festival in Puyallup. And you're lucky to get that. Puyallup? It was with deep regret that I chose to forego the joys of daffodils in Puyallup, but I had other plans. Saturday, April 15th, 2 a.m., we started out, one belly dancing undergraduate and one reporter who, despite his air of spit-in-their-eye confidence, hoped to heavens he wasn't hastening said undergraduate to her doom. It didn't help my conscience any that Louise Harper had agreed immediately to help me, angered as she was by the death of both her co-performers. suspicious or something? Just walk natural. Sure. Go on, I'll be right behind you. I'll be right behind you. Just act casual. The first three nights passed without any particular incident. Most of the time was spent trying to duck the police. On the fourth night, things began to happen.
evening. station was a circus of activity, a three-ring madhouse of reaction to the sixth kill. Even Captain Schubert seemed to know they'd had it now. The saving a miracle, their prey had gone to Earth again and wasn't going to show his corpse-like face for another 21 years. A certain reporter being bailed out knew it too. Knew it and was fit to be tied by it. Hey, Schubert, okay? Okay, okay Schubert! I told him. I told him. Near you? Culture. I told him, but would he listen? No, no, he didn't listen. No. I've been a policeman for 37 years and an idiot for twice that Come long. Come on, you were supposed to be in Puyallup with the daffodils. Where? Culture, I'd like to leave you here forever. I'd like to see they lock you up in a jail cell for a million years. And if you don't shut your mouth, the if general. you don't get the ginger, what's the matter with you? You want to see a doctor, you know? I'm serious. You sound terrible. Awful. What have you done to that poor man? I have never seen anyone so close to total stark insanity before. He just disappeared. We had him cornered in the alleys behind the Richards Clinic, and he disappears. Just... Vincenzo was so upset it took me an hour to get rid of him, and then only because I promised to go straight home to bed. Maybe no one else knew what was going on, but I was sure that I did. Our man had to have a way in and out of some secret part of the underground. And the basement of his old clinic had to be it.
You're not going to go down there. You stay here. What is it? Looks like a big air shaft down here. Where does it go? Well, all over. I'm gonna check it out. Just when I thought I'd finally struck out, I found it. It's in there. Give me 30 minutes and call the police and tell them where I am. What are you going to do? I'm going to get my exclusive. What do you think? I think you're crazy. That's what I think. You just do what I tell you. I got to get going. the hidden city beneath Seattle's underground. I was descending to the world of yesterday, the world of the 19th century, of bustle pads and high crown hats and Queen Victoria. The private world of Dr. Richard Malcolm.
you, you... Who are you? Uh, uh, Carl Kolchak, a Daily Chronicle. How did you get here? Through the, uh... The cellar of your clinic. Clinic? I have no clinic. Why do you say that? But, but you are... You are Dr. Richard Malcolm. I've seen you somewhere before. Oh, well, you almost killed me the other day in the alley. What are you doing here? Uh, what am I doing here? Well, I, uh, I thought I'd drop in and uh, find out about you, you know, <clears throat> so I could tell my readers. Your what? My readers? His readers. Did you hear that? Nobody is ever going to hear from you again. Well, I think I'll go now. You profane my world, sir. I will not permit you to live here, to stay here, to exist here. I'm, I'm just a dummy porter doing his job. You grovel nicely, Mr. Coal shack, sir. <clears throat> Daily Chronicle. Hmm. Sir. So you want a story, do you? He wants a story, darling. What do you think? Hmm? Oh, we'll see it this time. Yes, we have time. Why not? Hmm? Why not? It seems only fitting that one other person in the world ought to know, ought to know the facts. Before he dies. Hmm? Yes, Mr. Coach. Hmm. I'll not bore you with the details of how I evolved my formula. Suffice it to say that the attitude which ultimately blood of women, removed from their brains in the seven seconds following their death. I found that six were required to supply the quantity of blood that was needed for the 18-day period in which the elixir was prepared and consumed. In 1868, I first took the elixir. Then, believing that my immortality was assured, I decided to perfect and refine the, the formula in the hopes of bestowing its benefits on mankind. No longer circumscribed by time and death, what wonders on this earth could men not then achieve? Yes. In 1889, my world collapsed. Yes, 1889. <clears throat> Your uh, family died and you began to age. Are you going to listen? Are you going to listen? Or are you going to interrupt? No, no. L listen, listen. I discovered that the effects of the elixir were not permanent. I began to age. I had to kill again. Restore myself. That's why you, uh, that's why you look the way you do now, isn't it? Yes. Stage? by stage in 18 days. That's the way the elixir works. Yes. And then I shall have 21 more years to make its effects permanent. 21 more years? That's all you're ever going to have, isn't it? That's not true. I'll find the answer eventually. 
Eventually? How many more women are going to have to die? <coughs> What's a few lives compared to immortality, Mr. Kolchak? This is the sixth and final dosage. I shall take it shortly, and the revitalization shall be complete. If I don't take this final dosage now, the process will reverse itself. But I will take it. Hey, buddy boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Hey. Do you think there's any difference between this town and Vegas? But they saw it, Tony. They all saw it. I mean, even, even Schubert saw it. Carl, no one on Seattle's going to admit that a dead man's roaming around that city killing people since 1889, but I was stupid enough to think that they would. So this is it, huh? And I'm out of a job. Is that right, Vicenzo? And that I feel bad about, Carl. Yeah, why should you feel bad, Tony? I mean, you're still working. Oh, I don't deserve that, Carl. If you had any guts left, any at all, you'd go upstairs and... All right, Carl, I've had enough. So have I. Don't ever do me any more favors. Do you any favors? Why, oh, you miserable, ungrateful. Ungrateful? What do you want me to do? Thank you? No. Just get out of here. Get out. And next time you do me a favor, here, you see me again, just keep walking. With pleasure. And thanks, Vincenzo. Thanks for nothing. Hello. 
Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Crossbinder. Right. I'll be right up. So there it is, another tale of defeat snatched from the jaws of triumph. Another case of virtue unrewarded, of dishonesty being the best policy, injustice Will rampant... You shut up and put that stupid recorder away? Let me get the plate. Get that story, Bob. Oh, don't tell me when I'm going to get published. And eh, nobody's going to kill this story. It's already been killed, old Jack Berry. Not this one, no, sir. I'd like to see somebody shut me up on this one. Can anybody shut you up? Mr. Vicenza, you are a passenger in this car. This is my automobile. You remember what you said? I never want to see you again. I never want to talk to you again, remember? Yeah, I remember. That was before I was fired. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, don't worry about it, Tony. You're going to love it in New York. New York? New York. Yeah, that's where we're going. And you're lucky to be going with me. I suppose... I should consider myself lucky, too. That's right. Oh, cold check. Do you know that I have heard just about all I want to take from you or even hear ever again? You think you've got problems? Here I was, one semester shy of getting my degree in psychology, and what happens? You show up outside my house for one day. <laughs> mouth, all mouth, cold check. Compared to you, I am tongue-tied. And before I know what's going on, there I am being yelled at by that that captain of police. Yada da yada da yada da. Peace! Can I have some peace? 